Did you know that youth engagement in politics is actually increasing? Which is great, right? Well, it is, but the way we're consuming politics in the media is changing a lot, and it's having a big impact on the way we think about politics. Now, you're going to think that I'm talking about social media. Obama's campaign was the first election won over social media, and we've all seen Trump's prevalence on Twitter. But what we're actually leaning towards is satire. It's that classic image of the late night talk show host, observing current affairs with a sarcastic twist, making jokes, making the news a little bit more interesting for us to consume. Let's pull back from the daily Trump-induced chaos and take a look at the norms that his presidency has violated, and not the obvious ones, like the fact that he never released his tax returns or that his own daughter and son-in-law work in the White House, although, admittedly, I am using the word work there so generously <laughs> that I should be able to deduct it as a charitable donation on my taxes. <laughs> Now, part of this is that with the spreading of fake news, the fear of being duped by the common media, and newspapers not being so popular anymore, it's kind of comforting to hear from someone in a position of authority that they're having the same doubts as us, and that they can laugh about it. Academic research has found that youth are more inclined to trust sarcasm over standard news. It's a gateway to political awareness for people that aren't really inclined to be interested in these issues. So what are we doing here, man? Well, thank you, judge, or what do you call a lady judge, a uh, flight attendant, something like that. <laughs> it also makes it more acceptable for people to speak out about issues that matter to them, issues that they see in the world, because we can see someone else doing it. Research has also shown that discussing topics like this has made people engage on a deeper level. It's become the new water cooler conversation starter, and instead of discussing Ross and Rachel, we're talking about policy and development like it's every day. To speak about something sarcastically and create comedy that relies on current affairs, it takes a huge amount of research, and political satire is typically as detailed as the hard news, or even more so. It's also easier for us to relate to the casual way of speaking because we don't feel like we're being lectured. Sorry. If you want to know the specifics of a topic, speak to someone who's watched John Oliver, or Will Anderson, or Rove, remember Rove, and Good News Week? I know that as a teenager, I remembered what they said more than the nightly news. Down here in Melbourne, there were some blokes I met the other day. Shane and Corey. These blokes are out there working on a project that we've got going, one of three and a half thousand across the country at the moment. Is this going to be a long story? No, no it's fine. <laughs> at the same time, giving power to an individual like this is pretty risky. Satirical personalities aren't bound by journalistic codes of ethics, so they're able to put their own spin on things without a huge amount of repercussions because they're seen as holding traditional media to account. But who holds them to account? Just as the headlines of The Telegraph and The Sun Herald contributed greatly to the election of Tony Abbott, political satire like you see on the ABC tends to favour the left-wing liberal ideals. They also appeal to people with a higher level of education and can tend to alienate people that have not been to university. So the great thing is that today, we're more engaged than ever. More youth are joining political parties in their communities and at university, the plebiscite for gay marriage in 2017 demonstrated record numbers of people enrolling to vote and have their say. We care. But at the same time, we're more cynical, more realistic, and that's okay too. In fact, it's probably for the best. <laughs>